Um, are, does anybody have adjustments to the agenda? Um, I guess one thing I did think about was at the SU meeting last time, Shannon had brought up the idea about um, that kind of incentives for the teachers to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So, you want to do that under board correspondence or? Sure. Yeah, we can do that. Under. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, is there any uh, public comment at this time? have much public yet. All right, the consent agenda. We have four sets of minutes. Does anybody want to make a motion? Either approve them all as a block or separately. Do we need to name a wall or can we just say the consent agenda? I think we can approve them all. As a block. Okay. I make a motion we approve the minutes uh, uh, of the block of uh, meeting minutes that are listed under the consent agenda. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Um, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. All right, uh, board comment. Board comment. COVID. Yeah, so Shannon, do you want to, at the SU meeting, you brought up your idea about- um, Sure, I can do that here. So, um, so a lot of, We've talked a lot about COVID and the stress that our teachers have been under. I know everyone who's got kids in the system knows that every time one of our kids gets a sniffle, they can't go to school. They have a headache. They can't go to school. It might be a COVID sy symptom. And our teachers are getting the same thing. So they've been using up a lot of their sick time. Um, or they may have used up a bunch of sick time. Also, we've been talking about um, whether or not to mandate vaccines, um, whether to do that for adults now that they're um, fully FDA approved. We can't do that yet for the kiddos because um, they're still on emergency youth use authorization. So, and we have SU employees as well as uh, district employees in our buildings. So at the SU meeting, I had brought up um, the possibility of, of trying to incentivize being vaccinated um, against COVID by saying, okay, well, if you had COVID, if, if you had presented proof of being vaccinated or you have proof that you were vaccinated and after that vaccination um, should have been affected, you got COVID and were forced to take the five days off, um, three to five days, depending on weekends and things, because you couldn't come back to school. Um, maybe we can forgive that and not make the teachers take their sick time for that. Um, you know, and sort of, a, you did everything that we could have asked of you. You should, you know, you tried to protect yourself and our students and um, you got COVID anyway, and you shouldn't be penalized for that in any way. Um, and that we could maybe, we had talked about at the SU level, making that retroactive. It wouldn't be that hard um, to say, okay, well, your COVID shots were on such and such a day and here's the proof, you know, the PCR test that you had COVID um, afterwards, um, you know, we can go back and forgive those days and then do it going forward. So that was the proposal that I had um, put in front of the SU board instead of an all out sort of adult vaccine mandate. Um, so yeah, the discussion there, the thought was that we go back to the, each individual board and find out what the thought is from the boards about whether to proceed with that or not. So does anybody have thoughts about it? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think in general, it's a, I mean, I think it's a good idea. Uh, and 
I don't know, this probably got brought up at the board meeting maybe, but uh, one question I would have maybe is, you know, at the end of somebody's time, like at the end of a teacher's time, do they get paid out at all for their sick days or do their sick days just sort of get reabsorbed? Is there any financial liability for the, for the school district uh, for like any payout of sick days? Um, you know, again, I'm, you know, I think it's a good idea, but I just, you know, just thinking of questions that we may need to consider. We don't pay out for sick days, Chris. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, given, given them back their sick days, I mean, there's no, is there any other potential liability for the district or the SU? I mean, that would be, that was the one thought that I had was just, is this something that we then turn around and have to pay back to somebody when they retire? But it's a small thing to think about, but. I don't think it sounds like a bad idea. It does seem like a good idea to me too. So I guess we can express our support at the SU level for it. Um, yeah, I mean, particularly since it's sick days, not like vacation days. So it's, you know, seems reasonable. All right. Um, the other thing I would say for board comment would be uh, that we do have two um, seats that don't have anybody running for them. Um, one in Bethel for the one year term and uh, Chris's three year term in Royalton. So, if you know anybody who might be interested in being a write in, um, we should try and find somebody. Otherwise, we'll have to appoint them after, after the fact. So, um, yeah, think about it. And if you know of anybody oh. Shannon you're muted sorry um, I'm assuming that means that Rodney and Peggy are running again I was just wondering if we knew all who all was running yes yes Great. we don't have anybody else running at the moment so At least we have a quorum. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little worried about that. <laughs> um, all right. Any other board comment? We'll move on to the celebration of learning. Yeah, so I can just give an introduction. So every month we're hoping to bring to you um, a project that we're working on. Uh, next month we're going to have elementary students here talking about a proposal that I heard today that was just really amazing about chickens on the Bethel campus um, that seems to have a, a really a, a ton of planning going on at, at, across the grade at the Bethel campus around the um, that they're going to come and share with you. Their proposal was really informational. And uh, so I just provide that as, as an example. We're hoping to hit all different grade levels throughout the year. Um, and so this is something we'll have on monthly to kick off our meetings. And a principal going to share with you right now there's a school-wide book read occurring at the middle school that I was going to have him talk to you folks about and some of these will be video recorded presentations from um, students and staff I know that the elementary students plan to try to come in person next month they're really excited to see the board in person um, which I thought was great so uh, Owen I'll kick it over to you because this is is the middle school this tonight thank you uh, so just to give a uh, context <clears throat> White River Valley Middle School plans and selects a book which the whole middle school reads yearly. And it's in order to create a, um, a sense of community through shared knowledge and experience and to build that common foundation of prior knowledge. And I'm reading some of this, but, um, and it's usually about important social issues. And every student and teacher are expected to read the book through a combination of read alouds and independent reading time and teachers lead the discussions with activities to help the students understand better and, and explore the text to make sure they're getting it. And every student receives a copy of the book to keep and extra books are always available at the school. And just so you know, we've ordered a set of books for the board and Jamie already has one. This year's book is The Best At It, which is uh, a a book about a seventh grader 
And the seventh grader, there's a lot of issues in it. But one of the things that we heard from students last year really clearly was that they wanted to um, have more understanding and support for the LGBTQ community in our school. This book is a, uh, addresses that and several other issues. One of the things that it does is this, this boy who's the central figure of the book is um, grappling with his identity. And he comes from a conservative East Indian uh, immigrant family and he's in Indiana and it takes on a whole bunch of pieces and tells a very nice story. At the same time, he and his grandfather have some uh, some nice relationship, and that's the intergenerational piece. And there's a there's an anxiety piece, and the kid uh, exhibits some OCD behavior. So there's lots of stuff going on. Last year we read Ghost Boys, and you may have heard about it, and that was um, talking about a boy who had um, been killed by a black boy who had been killed by a white police officer. And then he talks as a ghost to the police officer's daughter throughout the whole book. The year before, we did The Benefits of Being an Octopus, which is written by a Vermont author and placed in Vermont, this story. And it's about students struggling with uh, or living in poverty and also some substance abuse issues and some family and domestic uh, violence. So these are not easy topics, but they're important topics. And I'm happy to say, I'm proud to say that, that we're doing this and we'll continue to do it. One of the goals we have is in the future to have students lead community book-wide conversations about this. So we'll be working with that with our um, community schools coordinator. There it is. Anybody have any questions for Dawn about that? All right, well, we'll move on to the superintendent report. So yeah, you, you have my report in hand. Um, I just also want to give the board an update um, <clears throat> that uh, around the principal hiring update. So the search committee has uh, called through the candidates and selected candidates for interview. They're gonna be interviewing candidates tomorrow night. I've charged the committee with forwarding finalists, um, either a finalist or finalist, that they are really excited and clearly believe that they encompass the leadership attributes that we're looking for in the next principal. Um, and that if they're not feeling a consensus around that, not to forward someone. And so, I mentioned that because we part of the reason why we advertise early is to, if we didn't feel like we had the candidates that we wanted, that we could always repost. Um, so I, I do think that there's viable candidates that they're gonna be interviewing tomorrow night and we've scheduled site visits for Thursday, just so you know. Uh, we put a invite out to the community for a, a community forum um, Thursday evening and um, the site visits will encompass meeting with students, meeting with faculty. There'll be a faculty staff forum Thursday afternoon. Uh, there'll be an interview with me for an hour and 15 over lunch. Um, and then um, if at, we'll be collecting feedback throughout, we'll have uh, Google forms that go out to collect feedback. And then I would be ready to make a recommendation uh, for hire if I feel like we found the right um, fit. And so I share that to say to the board, one thing I would like us to keep in mind, just because it is a competitive market right now, is that if we do find the right candidate, um, I think it would be who less to have a special meeting next week, even if that's challenging, to for you to interview um, and then go into executive session to decide whether or not you find, feel uh, confident in the re recommendation. So I just, I wanted to put that out there because it is a, a very competitive market right now in regards to uh, securing um, strong administrators. So that's one. The other thing I just wanted to uh, highlight is, oh, and the panel is um, got students. Shannon's your board rep. We've got uh, both your pr other principals, Principal Bradley, Principal Bowen, uh, faculty and staff, um, and, and a parent. So it's, I think it does uh, have a good cross-section of stakeholders. 
on the committee. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, that we've started to publicize that we will have the SU office open. Andrew knows this, but I wanted to share with the rest of the board. The SU office will be open and available during our informational meetings, both on the 21st and the 28th. That's on the signs out front. I've also got uh, Ray and Kate looking to put a push on to communicate to the greater community that if they need access to our informational meeting, you can't access it virtually, that they can come there. Uh, so that will be the site that we will provide that from. That doesn't mean, I think it's better if the board's actually all virtual, because I think I, even if they're there, I'll go from my office. I think it's just a better presentation. Okay. Um, so I wanted the, the board to know that. And then the other thing I'll add is, um, you know, I, I continue to get into your buildings more and more. And today, I just want to put a real shout out to the fifth graders at Bethel Elementary. Um, the presentation they put together in regards to this chicken proposal was pretty amazing. Um, and uh, there was a lot of research done and forethought. And uh, it certainly made my day today. So that was great. And there will be a letter coming out um, tomorrow from out of the SU office that highlights some of the recommended um, changes from the Agency of Education and Department of Health. It also will provide all of our schools vac current vaccination rates. We are not at 80% at any of our schools um, right now um, as far as student population eligible for vaccination. We've aligned to the Department of Health uh, work um, thus far, I think it has served us well. I think we can say that we've always aligned to it. So I think that that's the route we would continue to move forward with. Um, and just know that there will be an update letter to the community with that. And also all of our students are gonna be provided take home kits over the break and we're gonna encourage them to use them prior to returning. The other good news is I don't know if you um, have been continuing to check the COVID-19 data dashboard. We did get over our surge. Um, thus far, our numbers are much more stable and we seem to be in a better place across the SU in regards to uh, COVID-19 positivity. And I'll take any questions folks have. The only other thing I'll mention is, um, in, in, is that we have, I want the board to be aware that Principal McCracken's been working with his team um, around navigating um, some substance use on campus. Uh, I think Principal McCracken's doing a really good job with his team to um, tackle this issue. And that one of the things I've asked Principal McCracken is to work with me around uh, addressing a letter to the community that will be coming forthcoming. You always get a preview prior to the community uh, around the steps we're taking, uh, both proactively and reactively uh, to address address uh, substance use on campus. I think it's it always behooves the school that when we when we recognize that we have an issue, that we're forthright and transparent around it. And um, there's there's enough of a concern for me to feel like it, it elicits that we communicate this with the greater community to let them know that we are aware and that we are taking appropriate action to address it. So I just I wanted the board to be aware of that too. And I think there's enough of that out in the community of parents that you might catch wind of some of what's going on. Uh, a lot of it's rumor and speculation, but there is some basis in some unpleasant incidents that have happened on campus. Uh, likewise, we also plan before the end of the week to meet with all the students on campus and address the issue. Thanks for keeping us up to date on that. Um, would you like us to figure out a time for a special meeting? I think that'd be great if we could, Andrew. Yeah. Then we at least have one tentative. Yeah. Um, that would be good. And we can do that in future agenda or sorry, extra meeting, meeting dates meeting. later, but I think it would behoove us to figure out a date. All right. So we can save that for later then. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions for Jamie? All right, we'll move on to the principals. So I'll, I'll kick us off. 
it is spirit week here. Uh, I think that the middle school and high school are following our lead, but today is <laughs> I'm not certain that the middle school and high school are quite as quite as cool as they are. Um, so tie dye Tuesday today, and uh, excited about all the spirit going on this week. I would say the addition this this uh, spirit week is that the elementary has asked for donations for our local food shelves. So that's been really nice seeing kids coming in with. Uh, donations. So we're trying to do some random acts of kindness in addition to our spirit week. Uh, I would also add that our social emotional team has been looking at some of Ross Green's work um, and he is super well known for helping target level kids who uh, need problem solving skills. So uh, we're looking on training ourselves up on that model um, and we're doing a, a book study together right now on that. So slow and I appreciate that one of the almost last chapters of the book reminds us that we, it does take like two years for change to like be seen. So um, you'll probably be hearing more of it as we go along. <clears throat> uh, and then just we're wrapping up our assessment windows, which we're going to talk about all that data in a little bit. Um, but that's been kind of like a big hurdle to get over for us and shifting um, services for kiddos based on this assessment. And then I'll be quiet so the other two can weigh in. You have to unmute if we're going to hear you way in, though. Yeah, it's always good to have a kind, critical friend nearby. Uh, <laughs> in, in this section, and you know, we break it down in these three goals, like every every month. And I, I just added the restorative piece in here, but I know that Reed's going to want to talk about the green team. And I'll talk a little more in the next two goal sections. Yeah, so we're we're doing an assembly on Friday, kind of second round of our lead them up verification. We'll also recognize students who made the honor roll first semester. Uh, that information will also be published in the Herald on Thursday. We'll go back to our second goal. You want me to talk about well, that one? I I can talk about how um, I can jump in on the front end of that if you want, and that. Um, the middle school data team is working to tie transferable skills to the pod work we're doing. And we had uh, Chris Chris Ward from UBEI has been leading all of our teams. And we've had two really great sessions with him. And we're going to come out of that with some survey questions for kids, teachers, staff, and also parents. We're looking forward to that data coming in. And do you two want to talk about the other data pieces and then read not I can talk about that last piece about the meeting we had at the end of the week last week. I think just the Chris uh, Ward UBEI stuff is what's informing really this whole section and so mm -hmm. some specific math goals and, and the elementary it's, it's right now kind of aligned with the implementation of the new math program. So um, then Reed and I and a bunch of other folks met on Friday last week. We had a half day in service and we met the front end of it and got some subs for people. I think there's about a dozen of us and Jeannie Phillips from Tarrant and Anda was there also helping led us through a conversation about what is flexible pathways for us. Reed, you wanna add some stuff to that if you don't mind? Yeah, uh, so it was a, a big visioning session, kind of looking out to three years from now and, and what we might uh, aspire to um, and looking at what that work looks like along the way, uh, starting with where we are at currently and what some obstacles might be uh, towards getting where we'd like to be in three years. Uh, and then the afternoon, the high school team continued to meet. Uh, we spent the afternoon working on our, our rollout of uh, our personal learning plans for this year and what that might look like into the future with the help of uh, Ben Boyington, our new Flexible Pathways Coordinator. And going on to goal three, we're, um, I like that we're spooling up our annual school climate survey. So that's coming to folks too. That's gonna be out sent to all the folks that are connected to the school. And that comes through the PBIS work that we do, MTSS. And uh, anybody want to add anything to that 
because we're heading into our benchmark uh, monitoring report in one second, but I just want to make sure we hit the pieces we want to do in there. Rest of this. I would just say that the information from the school climate survey is really important and it's where we actually survey the kids specifically. Uh, some, of, you know, some of our youngest kids are teachers and then they're going reach out to families. So, um, I'm hopeful that this year we get a little more engagement in those surveys than we did last year, but it is important information and helps us adjust what we're doing based on that. So if you get it at home, please encourage everyone to respond. Yes. Thanks. And again, there's our newsletter, which we attach each month, but and you know that comes out every other week. And Mary Shell, our community school coordinator. Her contract began on Monday, and she begins on our campus in the Bethel campus tomorrow morning. We're looking forward to, to welcoming her aboard. And then we move into our um, our benchmark universal benchmark monitoring data report. Um, and just remind the board. You can go to the next slide. Um, that the SU board adopted these indi academic indicators for success under our three overarching goals, which we're calling our roadmap for success, which is about forming a comprehensive multi-tiered system of supports that really ensures all kids are being challenged and supported to reach their greatest potential, implementing a pre-K through 12 proficiency-based learning system that focuses on multiple pathways toward graduation, um, and personalized learning. And then finally, really looking to play off of each other's strengths and supporting each other's weaknesses around becoming a system that's interdependent, but also really looks to try to feel more student voice. Um, and so those, we've created indicators, for example, like number three, I believe that that speaks to capstone projects. I can't see, my eyes are not that good. But I think the number three speaks to capstone projects uh, implemented across the SU by 2025, um, which I think would really allow for us to invite our community in and for our community to get a much better sense of what our students are know, understand, or able to do. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And so part of um, the assessment framework that Anna is going to talk to you about is talking about how do we progress monitor our our schools and our SU annually to ensure that we're making appropriate rates of growth across the con, uh, the cohorts to reach our 2025 goals of the either being at or exceeding the state expectations on our smarter balance assessment consortium test those state summative assessments that are aligned to the common core state standards and so Anna is going to talk to you tonight about why we assess and the different type of assessments we use. Uh, the data that's presented to you tonight should be predictors to how our students will do in the spring on the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. It's also a way for us to measure uh, individual student growth. Uh, and so when the principals talk about doing work with Upper Valley Educators Institute, it's about informing universal instruction. I think it's also getting into best practices around ensuring all students grow not just the students who need intervention or supports, but also our students that are at the top third. Um, and so know that, that that is the work that's underway across our buildings. Uh, I've seen some of the evidence of the work that's happening uh, in regards to that. And uh, for example, like the high school math team, Anda and I are actually meeting with them after break. Um, they had some really good ahas after analyzing their data and some uh, actionable next steps as an example. Um, so, and those were universal next steps, not just students need intervention or not. And so that's the type of, of outlook that we're trying to do with this data. Anda, it's all yours. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, happy to be here to um, talk to you all about one of the pieces that we use to uh, measure progress. Uh, across our schools, and whenever we whenever we present uh, academic data, um, I think it's really important to sort of ground ourselves in the idea of why we assess. You've seen the you see the slide up in front of you, um, and understand um, 
uh, and be reminded of uh, the different parts of our assessment framework that we use so that um, it's, it's sort of clear that um, the data that we are looking at tonight is not the only, the, not the only piece of data that um, teachers and uh, other educators in the building and principals and um, myself are looking at. There, there's a lot of different pieces. And so we'll go through a little bit, some of that, just to remind us of sort of the larger landscape in which this sits. Um, but there's a reason why we have this data also and why we present it. So we'll talk through that. But um, I think a lot about sort of a balanced assessment system um, that provides um, different kinds of information depending on who's going to use it. And so uh, teachers, who are working with students every day have um, all different types of data needs. Uh, and some of that is really simple data, like a thumbs up or thumbs down on whether students sort of grasped the, the concept that was just taught or the direction or anything. All of that is called formative assessment data. And, and that can really inform you know, a teacher's next move. It can inform sort of the next class period. It can inform the next day. That's a lot harder data to collect and share uh, in a forum like this because it's it's pretty rapid and and they're often you know they're moving in different ways. It can be exit tickets that um, that students fill out at um, you know at the high school level. It looks very different, but that in in essence is probably some of the most uh, important data that gets collected and used on a really regular basis and informs sort of instruction that's happening. We also uh, have data like this that's you know state um, that's uh, sort of seasonal benchmark data, uh, and that gives us you know these these um, really important uh, checkpoints across the year. And we're looking at the same kind of information across all of our schools. Um, thank you. And we um, and you can sort of see that will give us information about sort of how whole cohorts of students are doing, um, whether our sort of our curriculum and our instruction is matching sort of the expectations for the year um, and provide us information that makes helps us make decisions sort of system wide. Um, though I will say also the assessments that the, the, um, that the teachers gave uh, over the course of January that will look at the data today that also has their student level data embedded in there. And so they're able to look at you know, which, which standards um, and which proficiencies our students are meeting, which ones they're still working on, what, what, do, we, what do we think, um, how do we think these students are gonna do in the spring on the state summative? And so I think it's important just to know that all of that information is, is constantly being looked at. We are getting better and better at being able to use that information and, and know what it tells us and, and maybe what it doesn't tell us um, and be able to use it in ways that can help, again, inform instruction and make decisions about what each uh, individual student needs, what classrooms need, and what um, you know, grade levels and, and schools need across the, across the district and across the SU. And so, um, let me go to the next slide just to give you a little bit of um, a reminder on some of these key terms. Education, uh, we are awfully good at all of our acronyms. Um, and so for today, for the purpose of today uh, and tonight, we'll, um, we talk about ELA or literacy, reading and writing. Um, and so that, that is one of the, the main assessment areas. Um, we'll also talk about STAR 360. That's the computer adaptive um, benchmark assessments that we use with the same ones we used from uh, kind of first through 10th grade in the fall or third through 10th grade on the reading side in the fall. And so that's um, common. We Computer adaptive means that um, the questions are adjusting as students answer them uh, so that if you know a student um, starts getting an, uh, a couple of them right, the questions will get harder. If they start um, missing a couple, the questions will get easier. It's still measuring the same um, proficiencies, but it's a way of really uh, targeting in on what, what the students know and getting a really accurate measure without having to give you know, each question, each student 200 questions. It's sort of an, an efficiency way of, of getting at um, what where student understanding currently is. Uh, and then SBAC is, uh, what Jamie already talked about, that's the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. That's what we'll generally refer to as the state summative. Um, and I sometimes just stay away from the particular test because those can sometimes change on us if the state makes a different decision. But most often a state summative um, is part of uh, um, our general landscape of of um, of assessments that we are we are keeping track of. So I think if you go to the next slide, um, we've got these are just a, a little bit more blown up uh, the academic indicators that were talked about on that roadmap to success. So we are although they're not assessed on the state summative, we are very um, paying close attention to grades K through two or even pre K through second grade and just. Uh, understanding where their foundational skills in literacy and math are. And we're trying out a number of different tools this year in different buildings um, with an idea of getting something that will give us um, 
or something or a couple of different things that will give us a good idea of where our students are and what's going to set them up for success in the rest of schooling. And so that's an important part to the, um, of our work. You'll see a little bit of first and second grade data today, um, but that is an area where we're still looking to find out what are the tools that are going to give us the most information about where kids' knowledge is and, um, and where they could use some more, um, some more instruction around um, key concepts. Uh, the next slide will talk a little bit more about grades three through uh, nine, um, and there, those are the grades that are assessed on the state summit of assessment. And so we've got our own um, goal set around our average scale score, which you'll see a bunch of tonight, exceeding the benchmark, uh, the state benchmark in ELA, and that's based off our current performance, um, which is is across the SU is tracking pretty cl uh, closely to the state. So in in by 2025, we want to have our average above the state. And then math, which is tracking a little bit below, uh, our goal for that uh, same time period is to, to meet that state benchmark and be right on, on par with the rest of the state. Um, and we're thinking a lot about those students who are on the state summit of performing at the lowest level uh, and wanting to reduce that number by as much as possible. Our goal by 2025 is in half. Um, and again, we use this benchmark uh, in fall and winter to be predictive of um, performance in the spring. And I think that's uh, all the, the um, sort of the background information. So I'll turn it over to the principals now. They'll talk about the, the results from, again, this one assessment that we've done in the fall and again in the winter, so September and, and January. Um, and I'm here to um, answer any more questions or add um, some additional information as we go through the slide. But I will hand it over, I think, to, to Andra. So uh, I think I'm just kicking it off by saying that this is this is the whole school in a nutshell right there. So uh, I think it's easier to look at the, the next few slides. Um, uh, so specific to elementary, um, I think, sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing far away again. Yeah, so you, you can read the slides for yourself, it's fine. Uh, but what I feel like that my takeaways are is that we've done some great job making growth in grades one through three. Uh, really some amazing growth specifically in third grade. Um, and even though there wasn't a ton of growth in fourth grade, we know that they started uh, off the year above the fall winter benchmark anyways. Um, so we're really happy about, I think, the, the time and effort we've been putting into improving um, some of our literacy work is showing off here for us. Uh, we are just now starting to look more at our writing assessments and how we're looking at writing, teaching writing, and assessing writing. So just knowing that's what's coming up next. Uh, and most recently, we did a, a K to 12 write for the whole school. So um, just trying to turn our attention to that going forward. And I'm happy to answer questions about the specific tables, but I think they kind of speak for themselves. Keep on going. Yeah, the the next slide is a middle school reading slide, and you can see that uh, our sixth grade and eighth grade, our sixth grade made a bunch of progress, which is awesome. Still not matching the state's um, numbers, and I'm going to skip the seventh grade for a minute. And the eighth grade has done a, an excellent job of going past the state standard, but also increasing their own scores. So back to the seventh grade, this is uh, part of one of our bigger concerns. The fact that also even that our winter score dropped below our fall score is very concerning. And we've met several times on it and on is helping me and the teachers figure out ways to, we really want to attack this and address this in a way that makes sure that we are making impact on this. And, um, I, my takeaway on this is that the seventh grade needs a lot of support, obviously, and we don't want to just like shift all of our focus for one year into one year, but we don't want them to fall any further behind because we know that hurts people in the long run. But then the high school, I think, is next for reading. So you can see from this graph that uh, progress is being made, that the 10th grade made substantial progress uh, towards the you know, expected growth over this time period, uh, while our ninth grade made a little bit uh, less growth. Um, 
our math department spent uh, two hours on Friday kind of diving into that data uh, and has made a bunch of recommendations uh, for everything from how we do a better job collecting data. So we, we missed a lot of students uh, both in the fall and in the winter. Uh, you know, still have a number of, of kids who are out sick. Uh, that we are having trouble catching up with to get the test taken. Uh, we saw a, a good number of students, just, uh, you know, students who did well were proficient in the fall, who spent less than 15 minutes taking the test uh, in the winter, and there's no way they're gonna perform as well when they're not investing themselves in it with less than 15 minutes. So, um, you know, it, we're talking with Anda about uh, the high school testing window because we're squeezed into a week right after the students have spent three days in midterm exams. Uh, so it's understandable why ninth and 10th graders, uh, especially ninth graders who are new to the whole concept of midterms, are feeling a little bit of testing fatigue there uh, with just how the testing window lines up for them. And I, uh, I can give a just an overview on this. This is um, obviously a lot of numbers, but I think sometimes when we take uh, some of the numbers away, it doesn't make as much sense. But this is really the, the, the key number here is the column all the way on the right, which is the growth rate uh, of each of these grade levels uh, in the district compared to the state expectation for this window from fall to winter. Uh, and, um, and it might be so uh, a one is sort of the expected growth for, um, based on the on what the state expectations are in the fall and the winter. So uh, we love seeing anything that's at a one or above. Um, you know, you see a two um, that, you know, or a, you can see that, you know, the, those students um, on average were growing at, you know, twice the rate that the, um, that the expectations were. And so that, I think that's, you know, that's great work. Right around a one is fine. Sometimes when grade levels start already above, um, the expectation in the fall, they're not going to grow quite, you know, necessarily as fast as they as they pick up the uh, new concepts. Um, Owen has already, you know, addressed the, the seventh grade, so that's the one place we're seeing something that's below a below a one. Uh, and the ninth grade as well, we've had, you know, we had just there was a there was a low participation in that, and I think the, not not necessarily alignment for why are we, you know, why are we doing this at the high school? So we, those are all things that, you know, we talked about and that we're, that we're working on. The other part that's important, and you'll see this when we looked at the math as well, is that uh, that column that's second from the right, the state expected growth, that actually gives you a really good indication of how much we're expecting our students to, to learn over the, of, over the course of the year, and particularly here in, from fall to winter, and how that changes over time. Um, so as our younger students at the top of the at the top of the chart, grades three and four, that's you know they're expected to grow between you know 15 and and, and 22 scale score points um, over those months from fall to winter, where you know in grades eight, nine, and ten those numbers drop to five, four, and one. It's not that right. It's not that um, that they're not learning a lot in those grade levels, but what th these tests measure, um, you know a lot of those sort of found, you know, found more foundational skills, the things we expect students to know. And so the, the numbers get smaller. And it's, again, it's not to sort of diminish anything that's happening in our older grade levels, but again, to just show how hard, um, you know, our students are expected to, to learn, in, particularly in their uh, elementary years. I mean, this will be even more apparent when we look at the math graph, where we've also, we've assessed down to first grade. So we'll, we can move on to the, to the math information now. Unless there are questions on this, I can pause. Owen, yeah. I, I'm just baffled by the seventh grade. I like I feel like it's same, same teachers, same sort of setup. They didn't, I mean, they didn't have the excuse that maybe the ninth grade did of doing this with the midterms. Can you comment on what thoughts are going on there or what, how we're going to focus on bringing them up and keeping the other, the sixth and the eighth graders going? Sure. Um, <clears throat> to a point, anyway, Shannon, because yeah. we want to be careful. And the other thing I want the board to know and the public that I, I don't want to make any excuses. I think several of you, most of you know me. I won't make excuses. I will own this. And I don't have an answer in detail for you, Shannon. I feel like, and Jamie and I had a good talk about this a couple times now. 
we need to attack this. This is not something that we just look at and say, oh my gosh, what happened? Yeah. So I don't have a lot of detail, detail on why I could talk about COVID and, and social emotional, but I, I, we need to check this and go after it hard. That's the best I can do tonight. I hope that's okay. Yeah, as long as somebody's like really taking this as the canary in the coal mine and saying, oh, there is a problem there. We need to, yikes. We are, and we do, and we also have some um, concern like you're, you're expressing, but we'll come back here and, and explain where we're going and what we're doing. Okay. This is the general combined math piece. So you get the look at this of like, you know, it's good. It's going up, 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 lovely, lovely. But there's some gaps and we go first to Andra. Uh, and I think one thing that maybe isn't written here, but I would say this out loud is that this year we started a vertical curriculum team, which I think helps us not be so elementary specific, middle school specific and high school specific. And I'm hopeful to add that team eats more, we will, that will help some math scores and all, all the scores that we see each other as you know one school and you know I don't I don't think the teachers are so used to meeting like that so I, I think that will be helpful. Um, okay. So I would say, oh my god, that's horrible when I hear my own voice. <laughs> that we we're really happy in the elementary that everybody basically has shown some growth and we do recognize that proficiency begins to taper off at fourth grade um we know that's maybe a little developmentally a thing but we we try to like really focus for the kids on how important it is to take these uh, assessments very seriously uh and that we use them to help direct their learning going forward so we try to instill that in them uh again so we're doing our work with Chris Ward through UBI. Um, specifically, the elementary, we're looking at fractions and geometry as a whole elementary school and how we're gonna work to improve all of those scores. Um, it's historically something we've needed to work on and something you can like look backwards and see uh, through the grade levels that we need to work on, uh, the foundational skills to work on that. Certainly we're not doing comprehensive fractions in kindergarten necessarily, but um and then again that we looked it out like our three-year plan and with our new math program so this is just year one and we're just trying to learn the essential components of the program but year two next year we're going to be talking more about the enrichment opportunities and components and then year three is going to be focused two years out on just expanding our instructional practices and i think another fantastic piece that's uh new and exciting for our SDU is the fact this math as a second language class that's being offered for any teachers of mathematics. Um, and so we I have do have a couple of teachers that have accessed that. It's a much higher level order thinking class, and it's really stretching teachers, but I think it's going to help them long term in their practice. So I'm excited to have that continually offered and having more people be able to access that and take it. Sorry, Shannon. Hey, I I just maybe for next year, because I know we're still like new in some of these math th math programs and I would love to see some representation um, of and I don't know if you shifted a year because as the seventh grade goes up now they're eighth graders or something, but like if you could impose like a red line at the end that says this is where everyone was last year because th these numbers to me sure this all looks good but we have these discussions this year and we discuss okay we're gonna try to do better for the seventh grade we're gonna maybe look at at the timing of the testing for the ninth grade because it's locked in there but next year we're gonna have this presentation and we won't remember any of this <laughs> and and whether we were close to benchmark like are these numbers great compared to where we were two or three years ago being closer to the state average i just I wish there was some sort of historical perspective. Anna? 
Yeah, thank you, Shannon. I appreciate that. I think um, I entirely, I totally agree, and it's it's part of the um, the work that we definitely want to undertake as we bring more consistency across sort of all the schools and the assessments that we're doing. Um, I think some of it for this year, why um, why I, we have not presented data that 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 way has been because of you know being in the in the middle of the of the pandemic. Um, I, it can be problematic to sort of present data, you know, against a year that, you know, has, well, even this year feels, you know, incredibly, incredibly disrupted. But I know the state has has uh, asked us not to do any comparison between sort of um, in with the state summative between last year and this past year and other years. And so we've sort of followed that same guidance. Um, but I do think, I mean, I do, I do think it's valuable. The, the piece and one of the reasons why we share the scale score now also is that it does give you a, right, a sense of where students are heading from grade level to grade level. So if you see sort of, um, you know, a, a grade level where their scale score in the winter and the spring actually starts to approach what the you know the next grade level is you know that will start to give you an idea but i understand it's not completely the the what you're asking for as a picture and we are we are certainly going to be working towards that um and there's the caveat just around um this year of um the hesitation to do some comparisons when school has been um so disrupted yeah and lord knows these graphs are hard enough to read like adding more lines does not help but if there was maybe like Hey, and now I'm going to flash this red line. This was last year, and this orange line was last the year before, and see we're actually going in the right direction. Next slide. <laughs> you know, like I just want to know, and and moving forward. So, great. thank you. How many years do we have Star 360 data for? Like, like if you want to hear that question, Anna. I don't know how far back we can go because after we moved, did it, uh, Anna, do you know how far back we can go? I wondered if it got mostly merged, if that changed it. I think that did. Uh, yes, I am not exactly sure. I sort of dug a little bit. Um, but have not have not tried to untangle all of that. We are we are looking at having some better support around um, one one data um, data database <laughs> uh, in which it would be much um, easier to sort of track students as they go through um, and see how you know how they're doing at both as you know as individual students and as grade level cohorts. So I think that is you know separate from sort of Star 360, but something that is um, sort of looks across all of our all of our data, and that's what I'm that's what I'm working on over um, to try to bring in uh, to capture this data and moving forward. Yeah, thanks. So we move on to the math in the middle school. And <clears throat> you thought you had questions before, Shannon. So these lines, we're so far off that green line, which is the state um, expectation. And it's unacceptable. And if you see, it's still the, the six, everybody made a little growth on their scores, but it's not enough. And we know this and we see it in the, the graph of grades three through, um, or in the case of math, one through, 10 and 12 that there's a gap that occurs in late elementary into middle school and high school and it looks like at the 12th grade it somehow gets closed again this is unacceptable and we are attacking this hard and fast um do you have something you could share with us as far as i mean like we talked about fractions being kind of a, a weakness is there other you know, like what are they not knowing in grade six that's showing up in this scale score that they should be knowing? Like what are what are we not getting? I don't have that right away here, and Andrew, but we can get that information for you. I understand what you're asking though. Where's the gap specifically yeah. in what operations or where is it that we're we're making that gap occur? Yeah, it feels like if you put the elementary headed into the grade six it's got this curve that it's flattening mm. out so that after like grade three even where we need to be attacking it earlier than six well i do think that um the elementary has done that with moving towards a agreed upon program and that's going to help immediately i think the middle school needs to do similar and i'm not going to speak for the high school but i'm going to say 
that we need to line all that up. And that goes back to that vertical teaming piece that Andra mentioned. And the math piece is, I mean, I feel like we picked that up when Jamie showed up. So we're working hard on that. And we're, we're, we have good faculty and good staff and tons of resources now. And we're moving forward with that. I mean, in our system of board knows in our scope and sequence, grade four is really when we're starting to introduce division uh, and fractional reasoning. And my sense is, is that, you know, our automaticity effects and multiplicative reasoning is not there, right? And so that's what we're working on there. And then that builds into division and then fractional reasoning to decimals and percents. And if we don't have those solid, it is going to haunt us. So I think that what's happening is, is that that gap's just getting wider and wider. Um, and so Owen and I definitely have had conversations. Owen's been talking with his teachers. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, this is, intervention's not gonna fix this. And I think that that is the takeaway I'd like the board to hear. This is universal instruction. Um, if 80% of our students aren't meeting the benchmark, you, you don't have enough intervention to catch those students up, right? So this has to be explicit instruction, universal instruction, and that's how we're attacking it. Yes, we have intervention in place too, but we won't fix this over time via intervention. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we didn't really emphasize, we were emphasizing reading and reading intervention, it's really year one for us in regards to math. Um, and so I think it's important for the board to remember that. And I think in general, um, you know, we've got we've to gotta make certain that we're teaching math ex explicitly, making certain we have enough and long enough math instructional blocks, which we do now at the elementary. That was a concern we had. And we have um, really splintered skills because in some of our buildings and, and including in Rudd, we had several different programs being used at the elementary school until this year. And so a student didn't have a clear scope and sequence in mathematics. And so now we have students who have splintered skills and gaps in their mathematical understanding that we've got to address. So it's, uh, you know, this is gonna be a marathon, but it's, it's one that we, I wish we had taken on a while ago but it's certainly one that we're focused on now. When will we get more numbers on this? Do they do another spring assessment or is it just in the fall? Yep, they will do another spring assessment. Okay. So I'll be interested to see where those are. And then next year when we have the discussion, again, it's important that we bring up this year's numbers and then show a slide with next year's numbers so we can hopefully see some progress. Yeah, we're needing to catch up kind of with this sort of slide. Like, do we have flexibility in the schedule to provide more academic time in general? You know, I do love all the initiatives that we're doing in that middle school, but just anecdotally from hearing my son's schedule, like, does seem like there's a lot of time that's not academic time, which, you know, when we have a deficit like this to come up, you know, is. Oh, and do you want to talk about that? That's certainly a conversation you and I have been having. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, there was almost, and I'm going to use my language here, there was almost like a grace or an agreement that. Oop, we muted. Sorry about that. There was, um, my words, there was sort of a grace we gave to ourselves in the middle school and, and Jamie agreed to it. And uh, I think we need to go back to that of, you know, we can't just try to balance a, um, a project-based curriculum with a skills base um, when there's all this gap. It's unfair to the kids to move them along in their cohort groups without having those skills. They're just going to continue to do poorly and we know when kids do poorly that they tend to further disengage so i i'm with you and we know this and we need to change our schedule to address this and we're talking about it right away okay thank you i appreciate that
Yeah, good question. And I think if that's it, we go to high school now and math, and then we will go to the growth rate chart. So one of the things I've talked about with the, the math teachers is how the, you know, the state benchmark expects all ninth graders to be taking algebra one. Uh, and, and so when we start the year in September, um, you know, many of them are prepared for pre-calc or pre-algebra. Um, and, you know, they were asking to take a test on material that they haven't learned yet. The same holds uh, for some students we get to grade 10 and they're not they're not in geometry and yet the test uh, has geometry on them and it is expecting that from everyone. Uh, so one of the, the proposals that the math department has, has pulled forward is breaking algebra one into uh, a two year program. So you do the first half of algebra one in ninth grade and will allow teachers to really go in depth into the basic skills that, uh, you know, frankly, the, the students aren't ready to tackle the first weeks of September uh, when they enter ninth grade. So uh, <clears throat> that's a, a piece of the puzzle is, is how do we remediate uh, for students not being ready to access the expected ninth grade curriculum that, that the STAR 360 test is, is asking uh, students to perform against. I'll just add, I mean, our goal, I think, as, a, as an organization should be our kids are ready for algebra. Yeah. 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 So is this a, a plan for current students to catch them up? Or is this a plan moving forward? Because it sounds like if you're going to stretch algebra one to two years, you're never going to get anyone to calculus, like by 12th grade. Well, we, we start some ninth graders in geometry. So there's a cohort of about, uh, you know, every year, 12 to 15 students who enter ninth grade ready to take geometry. Um, and those students nail this test. You look at their scores and they're often several grade levels above uh, what's expected. Uh, but then there's a, a growing number of students who are struggling in pre-algebra, uh, so much so that we've, you know, with the creation of our personalized learning classroom, we've actually uh, basically created a basic math skills class because some students aren't ready to, to tackle pre-algebra when they get to ninth grade. But, but their scores are all part of what you're seeing here. Yeah, but this, I guess my concern is the state average, the rest of the state is figuring this out. <laughs> like we need to, from first grade, I mean, I, I know you're starting out, you're only seeing ninth grade here, but we need to be getting our kids ready so that they're coming in ninth grade, ready to take this test. The rest of I, everyone well, is ready. Why, why aren't we? I, I would contend that the state benchmarks were developed before COVID and there hasn't been any adjustment for the loss of learning that's happened over the last 20 months when the number of, of classes and the number of minutes that students have had to learn math has dramatically declined. Okay, that's fair. <clears throat> So if I could just, so uh, the goal would be that we clearly articulate that we want our students to have the prerequisite skills to access algebra one in ninth grade. That should be our goal. So I'm with you there, Shannon, just so you, I'm hearing you. And I, I really appreciate it. that should be the goal. I think we are gonna need to do some, a level of like universal intervention to provide our students some access to intervention to get them there. I would not want that to be a permanent thing that we just say that that's what we have. I think if you say your expectation is prerequisite skills to algebra one, then 80 to 85% of our students should be ready for algebra one, right? And then we may know that 15% may need something different to get them there for 10th grade. But I, I think any conversations we're having in regards to the math department needs to be where do we expect our students to be and then how do we backwards design from there and that vertical alignment's the work that's underway but i would say in general had not been done well in that um and so no the goal would be definitely algebra one i think we're going to need something um a middle ground to get us there i think it's also ensuring that we're preparing our students 
and that students have access to universal instruction that gets them ready for Algebra 1 um, in grades 5. And that's where the backwards design piece comes in. And I think, in general, one of our goals should be, is our 85% of our students ready um, for Algebra 1, leaving 8th grade? Yeah, Chris. So, yeah, I guess ready to follow up on it some more too. I mean, so is it would the plan be to be offering like a algebra one part one cohort and algebra one sort of regular cohort, and then the geometry piece too? I mean, is that like are we sort of? I mean, and is it like is that how it's sort of breaking down? Is it like a third, a third, a third uh, that are going into those different areas or? Uh, or what's the so there there isn't a plan yet the math department spent uh, two hours looking student by student at what their our winter data shows um, and they looked at the number of students who are currently in, in pre-algebra and algebra and the number of students who are in algebra who aren't doing well in algebra uh, we see the same thing in geometry and one of the things that we'll discuss is whether it makes sense and there's a rationale for having an algebra 1a and an algebra 1b class and doing it over two years uh, in which case if that were to happen we would probably get rid of the pre-algebra class and start everyone in algebra 1a so that they're actually starting algebra earlier but taking more time to progress through it um, as opposed to the model we have right now is that everyone jumps into algebra one in the same place and if they they're struggling to to keep up with the pace they take a math lab class uh where they get extra time to get support to access the algebra but in that. if you put everybody into that algebra one part one then aren't you hamstringing the kids that yeah. were ready for algebra one uh by saying that now you're on a on a two-year track for this class instead of the standard one year i mean this is something we sort of deal with at the college level too with things like pre-calc uh, and calculus and or not calculus but like our pre-calc got split into into two semesters and it helped you know the lower students that weren't ready for you know like a full-blown pre-calc class but then half the cohort though they're ready for pre-calc and then they're in this class that that's just sort of review and then they get slammed the next semester because they expect it to be easy review stuff like what they had before and now you're putting kids on a two-year track instead of a one-year track so chris just so, you, so the board's clear we would have algebra one year long and then we, if if we went with this proposal we would have a two-year algebra section as well it wouldn't be in place of algebra one so you would have kids testing into one or the other. Or with other data too and teacher recommendations. Right, recommendations for kids, but yes, so. And, and students would continue in ninth grade to be able to take geometry. And so about over a quarter of our ninth graders this year are in geometry this year. And that would continue. Is I that just imagine. a choice that they have or? Yeah, I mean whether they choose to to do the extra work to be ready for geometry or not is 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 a choice or are I, those know. students that have already passed algebra one say metrics as an eighth grader uh owen might be able to correct me if i'm wrong but i believe students are choosing in, in eighth grade to push themselves into algebra so they'll be ready to take geometry as ninth graders okay, that makes sense. so they could pursue a more rigorous math pathway in high school so that they would get to calculus by 12th grade there's you know this also leads into the concept of flexible pathways which in the traditional modeling we have two students that will enter the high school ready for Algebra two, they're doing geometry this year. And you know, the self-selecting piece, we we're very careful and I'm sure that they're doing at this high school at no read in the Kolamath, 
we're we're not going to allow people to walk into something we can predict they're going to fail that doesn't mean we would ever deny somebody access to something but if somebody had no skills they it would be really hard pressed to get them signed up for geometry the parents get to weigh in of course as well So I think we go to the next slide then. And this, uh, are you on this one, Anda, I think? Yeah, so this again is the, the growth rate compared to the state expectation. And I think as was clarified earlier, those state, state expectations have stayed constant uh, over time. Those uh, have not been uh, adjusted um, for any of the, of the disrupted or, or lost uh, instructional time. Uh, they aren't actually the live, um, you know, it's not the state taking all the same tests during the year and those are their live scores. Those are just, that, that's the benchmark that's been established ahead of time. So um, we've got the, the growth rate again. Uh, we don't see um, the numbers quite as large on the, as on the literacy side uh, as we um, are, you know, still um, getting more familiar with the new materials, particularly in elementary school um and uh growing from there but i think we've got some um some good growth in some of our grade levels and some areas where we are going to focus more and again in that second um last column you'll see those numbers uh again getting quite high for grades one and two so just a reminder of um of just the uh, the high expectations we have in those early grades around uh the acquisition of, of knowledge and skills as assessed on these uh assessments so That's the data from the academic side from the from literacy and mathematics. Reading. All right, thank you. It is good to look at this and get the update. Um, look forward to seeing hopefully some progress in the spring and hearing about plans to address some of these things. Does anybody have anything else? Any other questions? All right, thanks guys. We'll move on to uh, Tara. Good evening, everyone. You have my report. I'll give just a couple quick updates um, and then we'll go over the quarter two projection that I sent to you. We received notification yesterday that we have been approved for the local food service grant. So we are really excited about that. We'll get an additional 15 cents per lunch for that. There's a lot of work to be done by the team um, to break out and identify the local foods and to redo some of our purchasing to make sure we're increasing our local food purchases. But we're all very excited about that. And I've received all of the equipment requests from all of the child nutrition team to get the federal equipment grant application submitted. So then the rest of my report outlines the deadlines that are this month, if there's any questions there. Otherwise, I'll move over to the quarter two projections. All right. Parker, if you could put, thank you. So the first side up is the expenditures. And at this point in the year, at the end of quarter two, we're continuing to look at the salaries, your budgets versus contracted. And we have a projected savings of $56,064 there. And then your health insurance, this is based on the updated enrollment. As you may recall, January is our open enrollment month. And usually by the February invoicing, those corrections have been made. So as of the February invoice, we're projecting a savings of $17,329 on the health insurance for a total projected savings of $73,393. You can move to the next page, Parker. So this is our revenue. Uh, tuition, we received a couple of new tuition students midterm. So we are up to $609,625 there. Pre-K tuition, we have two students. So we get $7,072 there. Investment income, or sorry, interest income through December, 
we're at $7,829. And then miscellaneous revenue, we've received $5,071. We haven't received any revenue for rentals and there hasn't been any revenue for the student activities nor their donations. And then the next section is your property tax ed fund. Uh, we have a $1 difference there. And then the state tech ed funding that still remains at the 146.6. And then transportation aid, we've received a notification of what we will be getting from the agency. So Rudd's portion of that is the 173.247. Vocational transportation, I'm still projecting that we should see them with all of that back. Driver's ed reimbursement, we should see all of that back. And we haven't received anything on the adult learning. As far as subgrants to RUD from DSU, I still anticipate you receiving all of that revenue. So as of the end of December, we're looking at a revenue shortfall of $38,146. Then we have the 73,393 savings on the expenditure. So a projected surplus right now of $35,247. The LEC section down has been updated based on the FY21 final audit. So we just outlined again the audited fund balance for the general fund for the last three years. And FY20, we had used that 55,479 as an offsetting revenue. And then the lower section, these are the fund balances that were identified in your FY21 audit. So the building reserve fund for Bethel had a deficit of 18,160. The Royalton building reserve fund had a surplus of $85,236. And when Rudd merged, that formed the capital improvement fund. So that co combines the two reserve funds for a balance of $67,076. Any questions on that? Um, so last year, uh, part of what got our surplus so high was being able to supplant stuff from the federal grants and, and whatnot. Um, yeah. Are we not using any of, able to do that at all for this year? We plan to do that, but none of those transactions have happened at this point in time, Andrew. Okay. But you are anticipating to be able to do some. All right, so we should expect that number to go up, I guess. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> this report is as of December 31st, yet you're forecasting a savings in the health spend. Is that would have, you know, those results would have been available maybe the end of January. Is that correct? I'm confused. Yes, so we looked at this through the end of quarter two and I used the February bill to calculate your annual health insurance premium to project that savings for the year. Is that savings typical or atypical? It all depends because you can have changes in enrollment all through the year if someone has a life event. And when we do budgets, it's based on employment, uh, people who are employed at the time of the budgets and what plans they're enrolled in. And again, that enrollment can change during open enrollment. It can change when you have new hires um, or if anyone has a life event. So you're not seeing any trend causing this change. Is that correct? Correct. Any other questions for Tara? All right, thanks, Tara. Thank you. All right, uh, negotiations. Shannon, do you have a, want to talk about that? Sure, so teacher negotiations are um, ongoing. We have some things um, that we've agreed on. We have some things that we're not in agreement on, at least yet, and so we're continuing to meet and we'll let you know what happens. Thanks. All right, um, we're going to the Energy Committee. Yeah, um, so tonight we have our first presentation from EEI Services, um, the per current progress to date on the energy audit. They've been here, they've heard your buildings, they're preliminary 
information and then give you an update on what they're seeing as next steps. Hello, how's it going? I'm Eric Lafayette with Energy Efficient Investments. Um, I'm personally based out of Burlington, Vermont. Our company is based out of Manchester, New Hampshire. If you want to pop to the next slide, I'll try to make it quick today because I know it's been a long meeting so far. Um, but we're an energy service company. That's what ESCO stands for. So what we do is we focus on energy and operational savings. And we look, we go through, we do audits on your building and we look for ways to improve the efficiency. So we're looking at lighting, we're looking at your HVAC, um, your controls, the building envelope, windows, doors, insulation, roofing. Um, and then what we do is we, we look for federal grants, um, we look for state grants, and we, we provide guaranteed savings. We use those guaranteed savings to help finance the project. And at this point, we're just at the preliminary um, um, finding stage of the project. So we're going through, we're doing walkthroughs of the face uh, of the places, and we're trying to figure out just big picture, what are some of the things that we're picking up on? And who, do, who else do we need to get involved to get more expertise and get more detail um, as we move forward? So next slide. Um, some of the success stories that we've had, um, Addison Northwest, which is Virgin School District. We did a major upgrade there a couple of years ago. Bennington Schools, Mill River, Hanover, Manchester, Portsmouth, and Keene. Um, each school district kind of has a different approach on how they want to go about energy savings. And I guess I'll get into a little bit more detail on that as we move forward. Um, next slide. Um, one of our projects was at Virgen's High School. They really looked at more of an all-encompassing project. So they did a lot of energy upgrades, including replacing the boilers. Um, we did LED lighting. We got rid of all the steam heat. We converted to hydronic. We also added solar, um, a solar system. Um, and then new roofing. So that project did not completely pay for itself. Um, they had a lot of capital improvements. So we did at the same time, we did a lot of ceiling replacements, flooring, um, and just some items that generally don't have great payback, but it made sense to do it at, the, at that time. Um, next slide. Another project in Vermont that we did um, where they looked solely at payback was Mill River School District. So they were all about the bottom dollar. Um, and they just were looking for how do we do as many upgrades and just let those energy upgrades pay for themselves. So over there, we actually did a dry chip biomass plant. So that's a wood chip boiler system, um, LED lighting, controls upgrades, and then analytics, which, which is really just diving into the building automation and using, um, we created a software that kind of combs um, the DDC system, and we look out for anomalies in it. So if we see exhaust fans that are running at nighttime, um, you know, those are stuff that comes up in our analytics report and it allows us to really dial in the control system to make sure that the building's operating in a way um, and is ventilating in a way when it's occupied and we're not um, use, utilizing excess energy for no reason. Um, next slide. So why do we have so much success in Vermont and New Hampshire? Um, we're based out of Manchester, our company, or out of Merrimack, just south of Manchester, but we really use local project teams. So we work a lot with Banwell Architects, which is based out of Le Lebanon. Um, we work a lot with local controls contractors, mechanical contractors. All the engineers that we work with are Vermont-based engineers. Um, and then we're really the tip of the steers, uh, spear. So we're helping lead the way um, from really the initial concept all the way through um, completion construction and development. So we're kind of your one-stop shop. Um, we handle all the architects, the engineers, the permitting, the estimating, and, and the bidding process. Uh, next slide. Okay. So this, I'll, I'll kind of skip this, but this kind of just says, this kind of shows that, you know, if you're spending $120,000 a year in annual energy savings and we can save $20,000 a year, um, you know, you can use that savings um, towards a lease and we'll pay for these upgrades. Um, but we'll get into that in more detail as we move forward with the energy audit. Next slide. Um, just some of the initial assessments starting over at Bethel. Um, you know, you have a school that is constructed in a different, in a couple different time periods. You have the 1958 original building and then the 1972 um, addition. Overall, it's a big school. It has, you know, wide wide hallways. It's got a good amount of space. There's separate cafeteria from gymnasium. 
the classrooms are big size. So it really has a lot of things going for it. Um, and it, you know, overall as a structure, you know, it's a sound structure. It has had a new roof recently. Um, and for the most part, you guys have done an amazing job keeping your existing systems up and running. Um, but at the same time, they're just way past their useful life expectancy. So a lot of the electrical that you'll see at the school is original to the school. There's mechanical that's original to the school, ventilation systems, boilers, heating. Um, and it's great that you guys have been able to maintain them probably 10, 15 years past their normal life expectancy. Um, but it also means there's a lot of energy opportunities. There's a lot of energy savings. Um, so you guys are a great district for somebody like EEI to come in and do performance contracting. Um, next slide. Some of the opportunities that we first saw lighting upgrades. So, so converting all the led lighting right, right now it's fluorescent, um, boiler replacements. Um, certainly best Bethel has a steam system that is very dated, um, in is not working properly right now. Um, looking at controls, upgrades, um, ventilation, um, analytics, which I already talked about, and then looking at doing some capital replacements as well. Next slide. Um, getting specifically into the boiler room over here, you guys have two, you know, very old boilers um, that are 30 plus years old, um, which are past their useful life expectancy. They are steam boilers. Um, part of your building is does have a conversion to hydronic, which is a hot water system, which you would typically more see nowadays and what you see more in res residential construction as well. Um, you know, anything that we would do moving forward, we'd be looking at converting the, the building over to hydronic and getting rid of the steam. Um, right now, you guys are bringing steam back to the back into the boiler room. It's supposed to come back as condensate. Um, so essentially steam um, when it cools, it condenses and it turns into water. And then that water comes back to your boiler system at a very high temperature. And it um, gets created back into steam through the boiler and it's um, distributed back to your guys' um, terminal units or your guys' baseboard radiation, essentially. And um, what happened, what you guys are doing now, you guys are actually bringing steam back and that steam is dissipating inside of the mechanical room. And it's not getting converted. It's not um, condensing into water. So you guys are losing a lot of actually energy just through steam. If, if you guys walk into that boiler room right now, it's probably 125, 100 degrees in there. It seems like it's very warm in there all the time. Um, and that's just, you know, it's a lot of excess heat and energy that's just dissipating into the air. So, um, you know, something that we would be looking at is getting rid of these old boilers and going with a either a wood chip pellet system like we did over at Mill River or a high efficient condensing propane system. Um, next slide. Uh, ventilation equipment. Um, so really your guys' school is kind of broken down at Bethel into two separate sections. Um, one section is provided by these rooftop energy recovery units that are 20 plus years old. Um, it's a good system. It's just they're at the end of their useful life expectancy. Um, they are operating right now and they are ventilating the classroom. So they do work. Um, it's just at this time, it is a good time to think about those ERUs getting replaced. Um, but talking about age, um, those ERUs are relatively new compared to the unit ventilators that you guys have in some of your elementary school classrooms. Um, these unit ventilators are uh, original, I believe, to the school, Nesbitt. Um, this was common in the 70s as they would install these unit ventilators. At the time, they were mostly electric heat. And then in the early 90s, they converted them all to hydronic, um, to water source. So that is common throughout the state. I see it all over. Um, what we typically do, so there's a couple different options here. We can look at replacing these with new unit ventilators, or ideally, you know, we go back with a central ducted energy recovery system like you see over um, on the newer part of the school. Um, next slide. LED lighting. Um, there's just some pictures of the lighting, but right now it's all fluorescent. Um, you know, they do some creative stuff with the lighting, as you can see on the left, by leaving some tubes out um, just to affect the brightness in the space if you don't need it as bright. Um, so that's some some old school energy savings right there. Um, now everything that we put in is LED lighting. 
Um, it's auto dimming. So it actually is um, producing a certain foot candle that we set it at the desk. And then it auto adjusts the brightness based on out um, um, daylight. So if there's a window near it, the light will automatically adjust down and not use as much energy. Um, so there's just a lot of different lighting upgrades um, that are very possible at the school. Next slide. And then obviously there's capital projects, um, electrical upgrades. You guys have a lot of panels that are now obsolete. Um, if a breaker were to go in them, I don't know if you guys, I don't think you'd be able to replace it. Certainly in this panel that I found in the back. Um, kitchen needs upgrades, general floors, ceilings, um, just some wall and some painting. Um, there's a lot of windows that need replacement. I put that in a capital project because there's just really not a whole lot of energy savings payback when you do window replacement. Um, and then door replacements, just in general, all the exterior doors on the building are past their useful life. You see a lot of um, starting to rust and daylight. So either at a minimum resealing them, um, ideally replacing them and just upgrading the door system there. Um, and then just something I picked on, you know, just general storage, you know, there's a lot of Connex boxes around. So, you know, that seems like that's a possibility. Do we look at building some more permanent storage and do we fix up the storage that's on site? Um, so next slide, I'll jump into the South Royalton campus, which I think when you, when you first show up at the South Royalton campus, you know, certainly when you walk into that front entrance, it certainly gives you a feeling of, Hey, this is a new and updated school. Um, I think in general, that might be a little bit misleading because there's certainly areas that have been updated, but um, there's a lot of areas that haven't been touched and um, really do need some love. So um, I know in general, they're looking at doing some new additions there outside of us, um, stuff that I believe they're working with Banwell on. Um, and same thing, they've done a great job with, you know, keeping all their systems up and running, maintained and maximizing the life expectancy. It's just at the point now where a lot of the equipment is past, past life expectancy. And there are ventilation issues and electrical upgrades needed. So next slide. Um, a lot of the same energy savings, lighting, boiler replacements, controls, ventilation. Um, so a lot of the same energy savings that you see at Bethel can certainly be utilized at South Royalton and are needed as well. Um, next slide. So just getting into ventilation equipment, um, looking over here. Um, so we have a cafeteria. I think I don't want to get I don't get into two specifics here, but my general review is you have a lack of ventilation in a lot of the areas that people tend to congregate the most, um, including the cafeteria, um, the library and the gym. Um, those areas seem to be either not ventilated or or completely underventilated. Um, and those are all things that, you know, especially with COVID stuff coming, we just want to make sure that, you know, we're bringing in the right amount of outside air. We're producing the right amount of air changeovers in the space um, so that we're just providing good occupant comfort. It's just not about, it's not only about heating, it's about providing good air quality as well. So I think there's definitely upgrades that we can make here at the school. Um, that will provide for a lot better comfort in the space and then bring it up to code and get us, you know, back up into the 21st century for, for ventilation. Next slide. Controls upgrades. Um, this is something that I know the school has been working on. I know they just did a, a pretty substantial upgrade, I believe with Alliance um, maybe a year ago around this time where they replaced a lot of their unit ventilators. Um, so this is a, one of the older unit ventilators that's still in the space. Um, so I think either making the decision of whether this district wants to move forward with unit ventilator replacements or going with a different system, um, but just some of the things that you can do with upgraded controls. So usually when we talk about controls, we talk about DDC, which is a web-based control system. It allows people to access all of your HVAC so you can check the temperature in each room um, from any computer that pretty much has internet access. Um, I think now, certainly with, um, you'll see a lot with different facility directors as they're um, being tasked with more and more jobs, especially with the lack of being able to find help um, at schools. Um, just having the facilities director being able to log on to the computer and see what's going on inside of their schools 
just provides that extra peace of mind and may prevent prevent them from coming over on a Saturday and Sunday when it's you know negative five degrees out to walk through the school and make sure that nothing's happening. Um, you know, and then getting more into specific on the energy side, we look at demand control ventilation. So monitoring the CO2 inside the space and making modifications to the outside air accordingly. And then, you know, night setbacks, occupancy sensors and trending to really make sure that we dial in the controls. And, you know, we're really only heating the space when it's needed and ventilating when needed. Next slide. Um, and then I'll, as well, this school has a lot of the same capital improvements. So door upgrades, window replacements. There's a lot of single pane windows around the school, flooring, ceiling tiles, painting, and then just a general kitchen upgrade are all just initial capital improvements that we picked up on on our first walkthrough. Next slide. So some of the things that we're going to be looking at. So what we've done at this point, we've done some initial walkthroughs. We've kind of got an idea of what some of the big picture stuff are. Um, when we go through and we're taking our next steps, we're going to bring in more specific experts, uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, um, people who do lighting audits. And um, stuff. some of the stuff that we try to do inside of districts is we try to create some similarities and some continuity around the district. So um, common controls, HVAC controls. So Whoever's running the controls at um, South Royalton, you know, can log into Bethel and vice versa. So there's some understanding of how the mechanical system at one school works compared to the other. Um, you know, then looking at, you know, doing, you know, if we are doing the boiler replacements, going with similar boilers at both schools, um, looking at if it's propane or wood chip, you know, trying to make a decision between the two schools. And then looking at doing bulk buyout at the beginning of the year of your energy use, um, going with common pumps, control valves, um, just so stuff can be interchanged. If, you know, if say a, an actuator fails at South Royalton and they have an extra one at Bethel, they can bring it over, slap it on, and it's not a, col a call to a contractor every single time. And then the same thing would go for door hardware and lighting. Um, just making sure that, you know, as we go through and we're looking at doing upgrades, um, that we're creating this continuity and that um, there's um, an ability for a person at South Royalton to jump into Bethel, have an understanding of how the general system works and be able to troubleshoot issues as they arise. So those are some of the things that we're looking at doing for the district. Um, and at this point right now, we've done some real high level review of it. And over the course of the next couple months, we're going to be bringing in more specific um, next week. Actually, we're going to be bringing in some specific lighting and um, transformer specialists that are going to be um, doing some initial audits and um, getting some initial energy usage of your guys electrical system. Um, so over the next two months, we're going to be continuing doing that. But those are the areas that we're looking into. Um, next slide. If anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them now, but I just want to kind of fill you in on where we're at on the process. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank All you right. guys. Have a good night. Thanks. All right. Okay, we'll move on to the um, information for the budget meetings. Or, yeah. So um, there's a slide deck. Principals need to finish their part in the front part of updating their overall information. The business office part's done. Okay. The SU part's done. I was just, as soon as the principals update theirs, I was going to share it out. What I really need to hear is from the board who wants to talk about the financial part. Um, I think you did it last year, Andrew. So we could Joe. share that with you. Sure. Because um, that part's done. Terry, mm -hmm. you can share it tonight. And then you could, if you want to tweak anything, tweak it. Um, and we should be ready to roll. Okay. Um, so is it, I guess let's take a look at the slides if you can share them and then we can yeah terry you want to share that with andrew and then he can give that a review 
Like I said, she's and updated those. Just, I just sent it. Yeah, just one board person to present then. If you wanted to, to you can. Um, that's a, Every board's a little different. Some boards don't even feel comfortable presenting it. So um, flex with however, however folks feel. Chris? Chris had his hand up. Yeah, I was just going to raise my hand and say, you know, I've helped with some of the presentation stuff in the past uh, and, uh, uh, you know, happy to help out again. Uh, but uh, this year, hello, I guess I'm sort of in the boat where like what Lisa McCurry had in the past and on that, that, la that Monday before town meeting day on February 28th, I'll be traveling. And so I won't be able to make that Monday meeting, but the next Monday I can do that one if, if, if you all need anybody to help out. But if, uh, but I can't do the, the Monday the 28th one. I won't be traveling. You can pre-record you. We know how to do that. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we'll take a look at the slides and see what makes sense. Yeah. I'm happy to help out where needed. All right. Thanks, Chris. Okay. There are uh, notes, Andrew, on the slide who presented the slide last year, if that's helpful for you. Great. All right. Well, we'll just email about that, I guess. Um, okay. So, proposal for revision for the UVM Green Goal. McCracken. Reed, are you ready to speak to what you sent in the board packet? Yeah, I am. Uh, the way Randolph uh, has gotten approval from UVM to do the UVM scholarship is to make it a competitive process where students write an essay uh, and then a scholarship committee is formed uh, they review the essays and choose the student they feel uh, is most deserving of the scholarship it's a different take on how uvm has it set up but uh, apparently they've they've gotten the approval to do it and it makes it more likely that the recipient student would be taking advantage of a UVM scholarship because they've kind of self-selected. Uh, you know, there are a lot of students who know when they're in 11th grade and 12th grade, well, 11th grade, which is when the decision has to be made and, and given to UVM. A lot, of, a lot of students at least think they know that they want to get out of the state of Vermont uh, and see something different for college, whether that's an urban environment or international environment or, or whatnot. Um, and yet the traditional way of awarding the scholarship uh, puts no emphasis on whether or not students want to go there or not. Uh, and writing an essay certainly is one indicator that, that students are serious about it. So it would give a financial advantage to a student uh, to do this. So I've included the, the letter that Randolph sends out. Thanks, Lisa, for, for getting that for me. Um, and if uh, the board so pleases, uh, we can we can apply to UVM uh, to implement this sort of program as, as soon as they approve it. Um, or we could take the Randolph program if you'd like to see changes made, whether that's to the, the GPA or you wanted to add any criteria, we could do that. Uh, knowing that UVM has approved Randolph's program, we probably don't want to uh, make the expectations any less rigorous than what Randolph's gotten approved. Lisa? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that, um, and I know it is in the packet, but there is a cut score, so the student has to have a, a decent GPA, um, and then we're asking for the students with that GPA and higher um, who feel like they're going to attend UVM to write the essay. So, so it's voluntary. They're notified that their GPA is high enough. Um, and it was implemented on a year when our um, students with the highest GPA had already confirmed that they were not interested or even applying at UVM. Um, so it felt like it was a time, um, the time was right to make that move. Um, we also don't have a standard valedictorian salutatorian process. So I just wanted to point out that's another sort of key difference between the, the two schools. Thank you, Reed. Sure. Well, I certainly think this is worthwhile pursuing. Um, do we have any details on 
who makes up the committee approving or just choosing? So the leadership team at the school makes up the committee. So that in, is comprised of um, the school counselors and representatives from, or the department chairs um, from our academic departments. And the names are removed from the essays um, and they're, they're assessed um, by that team. Okay. So it's, it's kept as anonymous as possible. And the goal is to, um, to be in a situation where students are really using that um, scholarship to the best of their ability. And it's really supporting our academically strong students that at going to college. Um, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I would just say that I think something like this would be a good idea. Uh, you know, I think it would help with more uptake of the scholarship and make sure that it goes to somebody that's really going to use it. Uh, and, you know, in some ways for the students, you know, it gives them a little bit more choice and, uh, you know, determination as to what they want to do. And, you know, for some students, maybe it won't make them, you know, if it were me, I'd sometimes maybe feel like a little bit you know, expected to apply for it. And now I've maybe, you know, feel feel some pressure to now go to UVM instead of maybe another place that I may have wanted to go to or something. But, you know, it opens it up to where it's going to go to somebody that, that really wants to do it. And, and I think that's important to give the students the, the choice that they want to make and be able to support their choices. Would there be a situation where nobody, like, have you had any situations where nobody applies? No, yeah. No, since we implemented this system, we have, I mean, we've had years where we've had just one person apply, um, but we, we have been able to send someone to UVM each year. And we do have students who like didn't realize that they were a strong candidate and um, were not considering UVM, but decided they could hang in there in Vermont for a few more years um, and then go to grad school somewhere else. Um, so I think it's been a successful transition for us. Um, it really came about sort of a year similar to last year where I think our valedictorian and salutatorium from White River Valley went to Middlebury and um, is it Quinnipiac or I don't remember the top two, but um, wasn't UVM. <laughs> um. Does anybody have any objections to doing this? All right. So. I, I think it's a wonderful idea because I really want to see that scholarship used. So, uh, do you need us to make a motion or do you? Have... I think I prefer that just in the event because it is a change yeah. and I could see um, somewhere down the line just having it in the notes, I think yeah. would serve us well. So, all right, I would. Uh, all right. So I guess I'll, I'll make a motion that uh, that we adopt a, a format similar to what's uh, being used currently in, in the at the Randolph High School. Uh, you know, pending the approval of UVM, that that us that the White River Valley doing something similar would be acceptable. I'll second. Whoops. Yes, got it. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, moving on. Um, resignation new hires. Well, you heard we did finally get Mary Shell on board. I want, do you want to just give a little background to Mary as a community schools coordinator, which is exciting. That's a, that's part of the community schools grant. Uh, it certainly was a key position that we've been missing. So 
Oh, and do you just, I think Mary's background is pretty extensive. So you just give a little overview. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and I know Lisa Floyd knows her. Mary Shell used to be Mary Whalen. And Mary Shell actually started her uh, Vermont teaching at Harwood in, um, years ago. And then she went to Twinfield, where she and I met. And from there, she went on to Up for Learning, which is uh, an organization that gives student Joyce and voice really powerfully within our state. <clears throat> she is leaving Windsor High School mid-year, which is very unique and in a pandemic and with so little, so few people to choose from. But their superintendent, David Baker, knows Mary well and knows uh, Jamie and I and knew that this was the right fit for her. Mary has always been a student-centered community organizer and has always moved towards making sure students' voices are heard. And as it was, she's always tried to bring kids into the community and the community into the school. Uh, you're gonna be very pleased with her. And she signed her contract for Valentine's Day, very nice. And her first day on campus is tomorrow. We're happy to bring her at some point for a celebration of learning. And we wanna do more regular grant updates and now that we have somebody holding that flag, I think we'll have that happening more often. Great. That's all we got. That's good. Yeah, great. Okay. All right. Um, do we have any other? Um, any future agenda items? <clears throat> we got a celebration of learning. Mm -hmm. We'll have a reorg. Right. Um, yeah, wasn't there a pathways presentation? Pathways presentation. Yep. Okay. Um, so next meeting day, we should. Uh, we'll definitely have the informational meeting on Monday, but we should pick another time um, for a potential special about principal position. Um, when would we get? Shannon? I was just going to say for that pathways presentation, is it possible to get that for both the middle school and the high school? Because I know the middle school has been working on their program as well. Yeah, I think it'd be really good to show the continuity, Shannon, across both. Okay. I didn't know, are you guys, is um, is it possible, I just don't know how, how long, an hour was enough in FBUD last week when we hired a principal. I don't know if you want to try to do it at five prior to the meeting, or if that feels weird, um, or not. Wednesday night's open, too right now currently for me. I think doing it before the educational meeting would be with me. Is that with Yeah, I could do before the, we're talking about on the 22nd or 21st. I could do before the informational meeting as well. I should be able to do that too. Okay. Yeah, I can do before the informational meeting on the 21st also. I think that's what we're talking about. I can't guarantee anything during chore time. I mean, I can probably listen in, but I won't be able to participate per se. I'm going to send you all an email. Um, and then if you want to send me your questions that you're thinking of ahead of time, if you send them to me, I'll, I'll compile them into a document. 
um, so that the board will have them for ease to take turns around questions you might have. Does that sound good? Sure. Unless there's anything else, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. So. Good night.